So welcome to numerical methods for mathematical finance. Yeah, we are still in our section on random number generation and having discussed a lot how we generate uniform random numbers. We started in the last session to discuss how we can generate sequences of random numbers that have a different distribution. So we are in this section on random number generation and we are now looking at generating drawings of other distributions. So the first method we were looking at was the inversion of the distribution function. And yeah, we had a very nice, very simple lemma. So if we know the inverse of the distribution function, so f is the distribution function. And if we know the inverse, we can transform a uniform distributed sequence of random numbers, or here written in random variables, a uniform distributed random variables, into an f distributed sequence of random numbers or random variable by just applying the inverse of the distribution function. And the first example we were looking at was here the normal distribution. Issue was that for the normal distribution, I do not know an inverse for the distribution function analytically, so in closed form. Actually, I do not even know the distribution function uh, in closed form. But uh, the remark we had was that there are approximations, for example, the one listed here and where we had the code here, that are highly accurate. Well, if you take a look at the documentation, it's accurate up to machine precision. So if you use that in the computer, actually it makes no difference to a closed form uh, solution. Yeah, it is as accurate as it can be. And that guy just relied here on um, the ratio of two polynomials, yeah, a rational function. So today I like to discuss another nice example, the exponential distributed random variable. And I will also discuss a little bit uh, this distribution because it has some relevance, yeah, especially maybe in mathematical finance. Uh, in some model, it's, it's relevant and we maybe will need it later again when we look at stochastic processes generating jump processes. So an exponential distributed random variable has the distribution function f of x equals zero if x is smaller than zero. So probability that we will observe something smaller than zero is zero. And then it starts with one minus exponential minus lambda x. So it's this function here. Yeah. So actually, exponential minus lambda x would look like that. So you have the one here and then you have exponential decay. Yeah, exponential decay and here you have some slope minus lambda. Okay, and then I take a one minus, so I'm just flipping it. So I have something like, like that here. And actually, if you differentiate this in zero, yeah, it's minus lambda times minus one, it is lambda times exponential minus lambda x in zero, it's just lambda. Yeah? So I have a slope lambda here in zero. Yeah, if you like to generate now an F distributed random variable, I use my inverse of the distribution function. So I have a uniform U that is equal f of x. So one minus exponential, the one to the other side is u minus one, multiply with a minus one, it's one minus u is exponential minus lambda x. Take the logarithm, divide by minus lambda. So you have minus one divided by lambda logarithm, one minus u. So the inversion method, so taking the inversion, I get that 
x is equal minus 1 divided by lambda logarithm of 1 minus u. Actually, there's a small typo here. Yeah? This example here is the homogeneous exponential distribution. Yeah? Though the inhomogeneous will follow a bit later. Yeah, So maybe you have to fix here the title. OK, so that's um, quite easy here. We have an analytic solution. Before I discuss this a little bit, what this means for the computer, let me give you a small interpretation for this uh, distribution. So this exponential distribution is used in the modeling of default times. So my x, you know, the random variable x, the f distributed exponential distributed random variable has the interpretation of time. So this means sometimes I will use the letter t or here for the stochastic time tau you know, uh, because it has the interpretation of time. So tau is a time in the interval from zero to infinity. Yeah. You know, probability that the time is below zero was zero. And the probability that tau is below a given t, this probability is my distribution function. This is one minus exponential minus lambda t. So if you make t larger, yeah, we will approach yeah, with an exponential decay here, the one. So it means it becomes more and more likely that the event happens. The inverse event is that the tau is larger than little t. So the inverse event is that the event did not happen up to time little t. So if this is a catastrophic event, uh, a default time, something that breaks down, this means that I survive up to time little t. So it has a very nice interpretation. So this is the survival probability exponential minus lambda t is the survival probability. So probability to survive up to time little t without any occurrence of this event. Okay, and this is a very classical model for, um, yeah, for example, a failure to pay some payoff or the company goes bankrupt or whatever ha event happened. And the nice thing is that this distribution follows from a very simple and very intuitive model assumption. So the distribution follows from the model assumption that the trigger that leads to this default event is actually memoryless. Okay, so what does this mean? So it means that if you have survived the time t1, so tau is larger than t1, so conditional to having survived this, if you then look at the probability that you will survive t2, then this only depends on the length of the interval from t1 to t2. So the past doesn't matter. Yeah? So it's memoryless. It only depends here on the length of the interval I observe. And this property here, okay, so this number eight, then implies that the tau has this distribution. So first, if you have a look here at the conditional expectation, yeah, so the definition of the conditional expectation is given here. So the probability to survive T2 under the condition that I know that I have survived up to T1. So this is the probability of the intersection of the two events. So the probability that tau is larger than T2 intersected, tau is larger than T1. 
Okay, but if tau is larger than T2, then I already know that tau is larger than T1. So this guy here on the top is just the probability that tau is larger than T2. Then conditional expectation. So I have to renormalize to all the events I am looking at. So means divided by the probability that I survived T1. So that's just the definition here of the conditional expectation. So now if you plug in our condition that is memoryless, so this conditional expectation only depends on the length of the interval we observe. So it means that I have here on the left-hand side, the probability to survive this interval. So if I move this guy here then to this left-hand side, then I have the probability that I survive T2 minus T1. So the additional time multiplied with the probability that I survived up to T1. So you see that the probability to survive a certain time span has a multiplicative structure. Yeah. So we just multiply the probabilities of surviving. Yeah? So these are all the survival probabilities yeah, because I'm looking here at the larger than yeah? surviving the additional interval. Okay, so this is just the consequence here of this little condition. So this is just the rewriting of the condition. So the probability to survive up to T2 uh, is just the probability to survive up to T1 multiplied with the additional probability to survive an interval uh, of the lengths T1 to T2. So you can think of of surviving from zero to T2 minus T1. Yeah? So if you look at a future interval, yeah, it doesn't differ from looking at the interval from zero to the length of this interval. Okay, so if I have this product structure, I can now look at the probability to survive up to a given time, where for this given time, I now just consider maybe some kind of time discretization. So here is zero. So this is my say T zero. And then I have T one, T two and so on. Okay. And here is my time capital T and this capital T is now my Tn. So I just consider a time discretization. Ti is i divided by n times t, so an equidistant time discretization. So every step here, so the time step size, yeah, ti plus one minus ti, this is just t divided by n. So I can just look at the probability to survive such a step. Okay, survive from zero to capital T divided by N. So actually this is just this probability here to survive this guy. And then the probability to survive up to capital T is just the product of all those steps. But now, since all those steps are the same, yeah, actually you see that here, oh. He doesn't like me today. So, but now since all those steps are the same, yeah, you see that the guy here under the product doesn't even depend on the i. Yeah? So it's just the p tau larger than t divided by n. So the probability to survive such a small interval to the power of n. Yeah? So I just have that the probability to survive up to time capital T is equal to the probability to survive just a small interval T divided by N to the power of N. 
Okay, so now what I do is I have here the probability to survive this small interval. And yeah, maybe let's just write the to the power of n, yeah, a little bit more complicated. That's actually the same as taking the logarithm of the base, yeah, the logarithm of p multiplied with the n, and then taking the exponential. So then let's make it even more complicated. So I have the exponential of the logarithm of the base, so of this p here, and then multiplied with n is the same as dividing by one divided by n, and I also give me here another multiply with t divided by t. Yeah? So that looks now a little bit more complicated. So now I can make the time discretization I have finer and finer. So in the limit n to infinity, if this converges, this will converge to the limit of this object multiplied with t, and from that the exponential. So this will go to exponential of the limit of the blue stuff multiplied with t. So, and let's call the limit of the blue stuff, let's call it just a minus lambda. So minus lambda is the limit of this expression in blue. So that means lambda is minus the limit, the logarithm of the probability to survive such a small interval divided by the interval length. Okay, so if you now uh, call this small interval, the t divided by n here, yeah, if you now just call it little t, that means I let little t go to zero and I'm looking at the logarithm of p tau larger than little t, so to survive such a small interval divided by t, that's just the derivative of the logarithm of p. So that's just the derivative of the logarithm of p of tau larger than little t. Yeah? So, and you know, the derivative of the logarithm is the derivative of the guy that is inside. So this is the derivative of the p divided by the guy inside. Yeah? So this is the derivative of the logarithm. But now since I'm looking here at t equals zero, I know that actually this guy here is equal to one. So it's just the derivative of the probability to survive an infinitesimal interval and with a minus in front. So my lambda is minus the, say, slope of the probability function in uh, zero here. Yeah. So this is the slope of the distribution function. So if you go back, you see that we actually also showed that my lambda is just here, this, this slope. Okay, so you see that we have that the probability to survive up to a time point capital T is exponential minus lambda capital T. So the distribution function is one minus that. Okay, so I have proven that this is the distribution function. And all this just follows from this condition here that we are memoryless. So, um, in a computer, maybe you have a time discretization and then you have these small time steps, okay? Then you can think of this distribution 
a little bit like looking in, in this picture here. So starting at a certain point, you have the probability to survive and you have the probability to default. So if you call now your probability to default little p, then the probability to survive is one minus p. And this product structure is of course that after you have survived, the game starts again and you check, will you default or will you survive? Okay, if you default, then the thing ends, okay? And you have a certain default time. Yeah, so for example, here of omega, yeah, if this here is the, the, the event omega that you default in this, this, this time. And you see, you have this product structure that you always go on. Yeah? So of course you have the one minus P to the power of N. So to give you a little bit more interpretation, yeah, if tau models time, so then you see from, okay, P is a probability. So P is the probability that I default before T. Then you see actually from here that lambda has to be something like one divided by time. So lambda has the unit. So this is lambda, yeah? And lambda times T should be unitless because the probability is unitless. So you see that lambda has the unit one divided by time. Or alternatively, if you look at our inversion, which gives us the tau from a uniform distributed random number, okay, the uniform distributed random number u is unitless, then logarithm one minus u is unitless. If then tau should be a time, then one divided by lambda should have the unit time. Okay, so lambda is a one divided by time. So that is a frequency and one divided by lambda is a time. And indeed, if you check the expectation of tau, so what is the expected time when the event happened? Uh, then this is, okay, integral t phi of t dt, where phi is the density. So now phi is here my density. So it is f prime. So that's one minus exponential minus lambda t differentiated. I get a lambda down, the minus comes down. So it is a plus. So I have a lambda, the plus lambda exponential minus lambda t. Um, yeah, if you integrate this, you have lambda times t times exponential minus lambda t. You do integration by parts, yeah, the bounds, at zero, it's zero because of the t. At infinity, it's zero because of the exponential minus lambda t. Uh, so integration by parts, integrating the exponential gives me a one divided by lambda that kills the first one. And then I do the second integration by parts and I get another one divided by lambda um, exponential minus lambda t. So you see that this expectation of tau is just a one divided by lambda. So one divided by lambda has the interpretation of the expected time when the event happens. And then with this interpretation, you know that lambda has the interpretation of the frequency. Yeah? So that if you now repeat the event, then Lambda is the frequency. So given that we restart an independent experiment after the event has um, occurred. So this distribution is quite important. Yeah, and in the modeling, we also have some generalization. So um, when we looked at the normal distribution, the inverse cumulative distribution function method for the normal distribution, there was a subtle issue because the points zero and one 
would be mapped to minus and plus infinity yeah, of the normal distribution from the distribution function. And that could cause maybe uh, issues yeah, in your code. And maybe it's good to understand what's happening then and maybe to treat these cases. And we had the example that there was an implementation that was actually mapping these boundary points to zero because that's more harmless. Yeah? I mean, zero occurs very often. So we do not increase or do not um, bias the derivative, uh, the uh, distribution. Uh, and we do not get a minus and plus infinity in our calculations. What's this happening to the limit points here? So the limit cases u equals zero and u equals one in the inversion. Okay, you have minus one divided by lambda logarithm one minus u. So zero is mapped to logarithm of one. Yeah? So that's tau equals zero. So the u equals zero is mapped to tau equals zero. So that means the corresponding event happens immediately in zero. Okay, that's a nice case. That's no problem. Um, the point e, uh, u, the point u equals one. So I have logarithm one minus u. So I have logarithm zero. Yeah, so that is actually a minus infinity, but I have a minus one divided by lambda. So that is mapped to tau equals infinity. So you see everything in between is a time between zero and infinity and the limit cases here are mapped to zero and infinity. So that means u equals one, the corresponding event never happens. Now with infinity, maybe I'm a little bit careful if this appears in my numerical code, yeah, because if I calculate with that, yeah, a finite time t plus an infinite time infinity is infinity. Yeah? So there are some, some things happening here. Um, usually this is not a problem because if you just look now at this time is the time where something is happening and your code only depends, does it happen before or does it happen after? Yeah? Then you just make a comparison. So you just make the comparison is a time, a given time, less or equal the tau. So maybe your code just has checks like that, is t less or equal tau. And then in that case, you would just check is the little t less or equal positive infinity. And we have that for any floating point number, little t, such a test would be true. Huh? So the meaning that um, I'm always before the event because the event never happens is um, expressed by this uh, infinity. Yeah? So actually this is maybe a case where it's not harmful to have this value in the inversion of the distribution function. Okay, if you have other calculations, maybe you have to check. And so it's always good to be aware of uh, what's what's happening. However, uh, if you look at the random number generators uh, we had here, uh, many of them do not even produce the number e, uh, u equals one. Huh? So we would just get uh, finite floating point numbers for the default time. So now an important generalization of this distribution is the inhomogeneous exponential distribution. Okay, so the inhomogeneous exponential distribution, well, the inhomogeneous just now means that my lambda depends on time. Yeah? So I have a dependency here on lambda of time. If lambda would be a constant, then that part here, uh, the integral lambda of s ds from zero to t would just be the lambda times t. But now lambda is allowed to depend on time. Yeah? So, and 
you know, my interpretation for the lambda was, it is something like um, a frequency. It has units one divided by time. But if you look back, maybe here, you also see that lambda is the derivative of the probability with respect to time. So lambda is a velocity. So lambda is a velocity, yeah, it's probability per time. And here I'm just integrating this velocity over some other time s. Yeah? So actually this is just a time transformation. Yeah? So lambda is like a scaling factor that is and shrinking or dilating the time. And here, this time transformation is allowed to depend on the S. So I'm transforming from the time S to the time T with this lambda. So that's the inhomogeneous exponential distribution. So can I do the inverse of the distribution function here? So again, I have the U should be the F of T. So now I have write T because it is a time. Uh, so it is a one minus exponential. So bring the one to the other side, um, multiply with a minus one. So I have one minus U, take the logarithm. So I have something like minus integral zero T lambda s ds equals the logarithm of one minus u. Oh, so maybe I can also move the minus to the other side. So that guy goes also to the other side. So I have an equal minus the logarithm one minus u. So this guy already looks like the ICDF for lambda equal to one, yeah? So that's actually the inverse if there would be no time transformation. And then you see that what I now need is the inverse of this time transformation. So this guy here is transforming transforming time from S, the time that runs in the way with the speed lambda equals one, to time t. So if I can do the inverse of the distribution function depends on if I can invert this time transformation. So if now my capital lambda of t is the transformed time, so the integral from zero to t lambda of s ds, then if I know the inverse of lambda, so if lambda inverse is known, yeah, then I can just on the previous slide apply the inverse of the lambda and I get that my inhomogeneous distributed default time tau is minus lambda inverse logarithm of one minus u. So in, in the general case, yeah, you do not have an inverse of uh, this lambda. So what can we do? Um, <clears throat> well, in the practical application, actually you could now create a time discretization and then you approximate the integral no, by say a finite sum. So you do a numerical approximation of the integral, or you could just from the beginning think of that your function little lambda is a piecewise constant function. And a little bit I make, made this remark before yeah, when I was talking about that sometimes we do not have the accurate inverse of the distribution function, but that doesn't matter because we just are building models, models that should calibrate to what we observe. And often you do not have enough data to actually fit 
a continuous function to something. So sticking to say a special class of functions, like for example, piecewise constant functions is maybe just a model assumption. So you could just think of having a model where lambda is a piecewise constant function, maybe with a fine time discretization. And that model is maybe already very accurate. So we can maybe use the inversion method if we can approximate this integral. In that case, we have an approximation of the inversion of the distribution function uh, by just considering a time discretization. Or alternatively, you could think that the function lambda is already a piecewise constant function. So you could view the a piecewise, you could consider a piecewise constant approximation of the lambda, or alternatively, you could think that the lambda was piecewise constant from the beginning. So you could consider only those lambda that are already piecewise constant, which is then just um, a model assumption. So in any case, let's introduce now a time discretization on my time t, little t, and introduce lambda i being the partial integrals of lambda s ds. So if I now consider the distribution function that corresponds to the piecewise constant lambdas, then this is here the f of t, f of t is one minus exponential and then minus the integral from zero to t, but now the lambda is piecewise constant. So that's minus the sum over all these intervals. Uh, so tj to tj plus one multiplied with the lambda j. Okay, that's just here the partial integral. And then it's just the sum of all those partial integrals. And then the last integral runs from ti to little t. So the last integral is just here, the lambda i times t minus ti, where now the i is the index where little t is in between ti and ti plus one. So the index i is depending here on t. Yeah? So this means that my little t is in the interval from ti to ti plus one. Mm -hmm. So I have a piecewise constant lambda either from the beginning or I consider it as an approximation. And then I have here this distribution function where the integral now becomes this um, approximation or uh, sum. Yeah. So now I can apply the inversion to this distribution function. So this F can be inverted and you know, maybe also quite um, efficiently. So what do I do? So first I do the transformation, the inversion of the distribution function for the case lambda equals one. So that is the step that I already did, the step before I apply the inverse of my capital lambda. Okay, so this is already a time. So this is the So this is the default time in say the S time space. Yeah, so the, with the S time, I mean, yeah, it was integral from zero to, to capital T lambda of S. So lambda is the time, this, the transformation that transforms times in S to times in T. So that is the case where lambda is equal to one. So this is already this default time. And now I'm checking where am I lying in my time discretization. 
So I'll find the index i such that the integral from zero to ti is smaller than the set, yeah? integral from zero to ti lambda of s ds, and the integral from zero to ti plus one is larger. So I look, I'm searching at this interval. So this guy here is the integral zero to ti lambda of s ds. And this guy here is the integral from zero to ti plus one lambda of s ds. So then I know that I look, at, I have to search my solution in this interval. So I know that the tau has to be in this interval. So from that, I know that the tau is in the interval from ti to ti plus one. Yeah, uh, this starting point ti is already known. Yeah, This corresponds then to the time s being this integral. So I just look at the remaining part set minus this part, yeah, this partial integral and divided by the lambda i, yeah? the speed, the time transformation that is applicable for this interval to get the remaining uh, fraction. Yeah? So I can just invert this. Um, yeah, so maybe in an implementation, you would create a small table yeah, by first calculating all those partial um, interval, discretization intervals. Yeah? So the times SI that would correspond to the times Ti, yeah? and then you just search in this table, where is Z lying? Yeah? So this is actually Z is in Si to Si plus one. So this tells you that tau will be in Ti to Ti plus one. So you could maybe just call this guy here the Si, and this guy here could be called the Si plus one. So then you have found the inversion of this distribution function f. Yeah? So I have found the tau. Yeah, that was maybe now a nice and small excursion yeah, uh, to the exponential distribution. And maybe that distribution will pop up again when we look at stochastic processes, yeah, where we like to simulate default times, yeah, Poisson processes. Yeah. This is uh, maybe what you need. And um, also maybe a small remark here to this approximation, yeah, assuming a piecewise constant lambda. Uh, that might appear brutal, but if you look back, actually the way I've written it here is that I'm not using some Euler approximation or Riemann approximation where I just take lambda i to be lambda of ti. Yeah? So you could also just try to approximate it by saying lambda i is lambda of uh, ti. So um, of a specific time point. So you just take here always the starting point. Okay, so I'm not doing this. Yeah? I have defined here the lambda i to be actually the average of lambda over this time. So that means if you now multiply lambda i with this time interval, this is the exact value of the integral. So that means this part here is really the integral from zero to ti. Yeah? So it goes to i minus one, but then it's tj to tj plus one. So this is really the integral lambda of s ds from zero to ti 
because my lambda was defined like that. So there is no approximation error in this part here. The only approximation error is in this part. So the only approximation error here is in this part. And if you make the time discretization small, this is a very small error. And you also see that the error does not, acc not accumulate. So you are correct in the sense that you find the correct interval, you know, ti to ti plus one, you find the correct interval where you are in, but maybe the location inside this interval, this is maybe a little bit incorrect because you have assumed this approximation. So that said, you see that this is already maybe a numerical method, yeah? a time discretization here for the distribution function to apply the inverse. And um, it's specified in a way that we have a very small uh, numerical error. Okay, so let's have a small break and continue with acceptance rejection. <laughs> 